if you feel his presence. Can we lift our hands one more time? Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity and the privilege to feel you, to enjoy and bask in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for that, Jesus. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You can be seated. I know you've been standing for a while. There's no substitute for feeling the Holy Ghost, for being in the presence of the Lord. Anybody like French fry sandwiches? I, I love French fry sandwiches. For the past 10 months, I've done all the grocery shopping in our home. And I'll buy a bag of them frozen ones. And uh, I'm not throwing Jennifer under the bus, but we'll put them on a pan and she puts them in the oven. And I'll put them on some bread. I don't want that nine grain healthy bread. I want some old Marita white bread <laughs> with some ketchup on it. And they're good. But on occasion, my mother will call me or I'll text her and she'll ask if I want a French fry sandwich. And when you walk into mama's, I can hear the fry daddy, the grease is popping. She's hand peeled them and cut them up in the way I like them. And she, I like them done extra crispy. And there is no substitute for the real thing. And when I come into the house of the Lord, there is no substitute for the presence of the Holy Ghost. All across this country today, they are people that have assembled together and they're singing and they're worshiping and they're, they're praising the Lord, but they don't feel the power of the Holy Ghost like we have felt in the house today. And I'm thankful for that. What a message from Pastor this morning. What a word. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 5. Book of Acts chapter 5. And you can remain seated while we read our text this morning. I, I don't know how it is for, for other people, but for me, a, a message or a sermon always comes. Uh, it's born out of just a thought, maybe just a short or a small thought, uh, sometimes in a dream or, or sometimes just in reading or praying. And there are some thoughts that you have that you push to the back burner and you so well, everybody's heard that a thousand times. And there's some thoughts that you say, well, that's not very popular. You know, people don't want to hear that. And, and uh, I keep pushing back and pushing back and pushing back. And I've pushed this back for several months now. And, and uh, so I'm going to ask you to pray for me this morning and help me because I just feel that the Lord, uh, again, it's not a popular message. And uh, I'm not here to throw rocks. Matter of a fact, most every thought that I get is really for me. So I'll preach to myself this morning. This is for me. And if you want to join, uh, I'd appreciate that. So the book of Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. And then the high priest rose up, and all that they were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. And concluding with verse 18, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And just for a few moments this morning, and I'm going to be mindful of the time, I, I want to preach to you from this topic, praying with power. Praying with power. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I love you. 
I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord and to feel your presence. I just ask for the next few minutes that as a congregation you would unite us and bind us, clear our hearts and minds and help us to receive what thus saith the Lord. And I'll ask, Lord, that you help me, help these lips of clay, Lord. I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I wished I was living in the days of the book of Acts, you know, be a part of the early church. There were miracles and signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Ghost was falling and people were being baptized everywhere and in the name of Jesus. The lame were walking, the, the deaf were hearing, the blind was seeing. Everywhere you went, you were having church. You would go to somebody's home and they would eat and they would, they would have church. It would just had been very easy to live for the Lord back in those days. I thought about the first time the Holy Ghost may have came to Acts chapter 2 when he baptizes his people with tongues and fire and the amazement it must have been to have been a part of that. But to be honest, when I think that way or when we think that way, we're not completely processing the information that is before us. You say, well, Jerry, what do you mean by that? What I mean is is that all the information is right here in the book, but sometimes we only see what is comfortable and what is exciting, and we sometimes overlook the persecution and the hostility that was raging against the church. And it's important that when we read and we study the book of Acts and the new church that's in the New Testament, that we look at all that they went through, both good and bad. You see the early church, as much as they were highly anointed and used by God, they were equally hated and persecuted because of their faith. But they were yet bold and aggressive and they were faithful to the calling of the ministry. Now I I have opened with that and said all that to say this. I believe that we are seeing and will continue to see similar times in what the early church experienced. But allow me to leave us with a thought this morning that every Holy Ghost filled saint of God should be concerned with. And that concern is is that we are living in the days that the gospel and the name of Jesus is being proclaimed across the map. and, And we're being attacked just as they were in the books of Acts. However, we are not living in the same apostolic power that the book of Acts church were. The early church lived under the continual threat of persecution, but the church also lived under the continual power of the Holy Ghost. And the concern is is that we're going to see more and more persecution against the church. And what I mean by that is our beliefs and our rights being attacked. We may or may not see physical harm in our future, But it seems, unless you've got your head stuck in the sand, every time you turn on the news, everywhere you look, whether it be on local, state level, or federal level, the church, our beliefs, and our rights are being attacked. Now, it may be in fine print on that house bill at the bottom of the line, but they're trying to take away the rights of the church And ladies and gentlemen, they're trying to put a muzzle on the pulpit in what is being said across the world today. Make no mistake about that. But the church, the present church, this current church, is not moving and living in apostolic power to the fullest potential. And I'm going to say this, and I believe this with all my heart, as much as the church is beginning to experience persecution and hostility against it, I know this has been said a hundred times in the last few months, but this is the greatest hour and the greatest time to be a part of the church. If we will stay tuned in and plugged in, we're about to see God do things that we could never imagine. We're about to see God open up the gates of heaven and pour out spirits and power like we've never experienced. It is the greatest time to be a part of the church. But here here is the question. How are we 
you and I. I'm, I'm not preaching to a church in general. I'm not preaching to the UPC today. This message here is for Hatchman Apostolic Church, you and I. How are we going to get the apostolic power that we read about in the book of Acts? The answer is very simple, although the path is rough. It's a tough one. We've got to go down the same path as the early church did. It all starts in the upper room where 120 men and women who recognized that the task before them and understood their inability to accomplish in their own human ability. So they set themselves to praying and seeking the face of God, crying out in faith. Before Jesus left in Acts 1 and 8, he told them, he said, I'm going to send you power from on high. In Luke 24, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Jesus knew the work that he would require of them would take supernatural power and Jesus knew that it was a spiritual battle. You see, he had spent his three and a half years of ministry on earth in spiritual warfare. Jesus also knew that the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire would equip them for the battle in this spiritual warfare. And this is where we must get to. We have to get to Jesus' words first concerning the baptism of power. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry there until how long? Until. How long is until? As long as it takes. Until heaven hears us. Until our weakness is closed with his strength. Until the fire of God sets us on fire. They waited. They waited. They waited. We could stop right there and I could preach till the sun goes down about waiting. I told you a couple of weeks ago how I struggle with waiting and I'm working on that. It's a lost art today to wait. But we live in a microwave age where we want everything right now and need it right now. And I'll go to the front of the line. I'm guilty of that. I can go home this afternoon and order me something for the shop from Amazon. Amazon, and there's a good chance I'm going to see the truck driving down the driveway tomorrow afternoon or possibly Tuesday. But when we learn to wait, the, the Holy Ghost could have rushed right into the upper room immediately and poured itself out upon them. But there's something to be said in waiting. When waiting, motives are exposed. Attitudes are corrected. Hunger is increased. Waiting. Waiting is the way that God prepares us to receive. Terry. Until the power comes. Jacob had that until disposition as he wrestled the angel of the Lord. The angel said, let me go for the day breaketh. Jacob said, I will not let thee go until you bless me. And that's where we've got to get to as individuals and as a church. I won't let you go till you bless me, Lord. I won't leave this service, Lord. I won't leave this altar until you pour your spirit out on me and set my heart on fire that I have a passion for the move and the work of God. I say this respectfully, and I've I've told you in the beginning that I'm preaching to myself, so please do not be offended by this. If you are, see me after church. I want to formally apologize. But the reason we are not experiencing as much apostolic power today as the early church did is because there's very little apostolic praying going on. When the church begins praying with power, then and only then will we receive apostolic power the way the book of Acts church first experienced it. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles had been threatened for their preaching and teaching in Jesus' name. The Bible says they were gathered together and prayed, and the place where they assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Verse 33 of chapter 4 tells us, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I read in our opening text this morning, it said that by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought or performed among the people. How many want to see that in our service? How many want to see the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk? How many want to see your lost loved ones in the altars 
filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. How many want to see this baptistry full of people being baptized in the name of Jesus, their lives being changed, and the Lord working and moving in their lives? God is still the same God. He's still in the miracle working business. We must change. It is us that must change and form ourselves to the will of God. The point, the point I'm trying to make this morning is they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. There was a fresh baptism of apostolic power that came upon them when they prayed. I believe that's why the devil fights us so hard about being in church together. I'm I'm not making light of how serious this pandemic has been. But you make no mistake about it. It has been used as a tool to try and keep the church from assembling together. I'm all for being safe and protecting ourselves and, and following the guidelines. But we must not allow ourselves to be isolated or separated because our strength comes from our unity. We all have a responsibility to have our own prayer closet, our own prayer time. But the power of the church comes when we're assembled together, bound together, and praying for the move and the work of God. The devil is not afraid of our singing. The devil's not afraid if we shout or jump or run here this morning. The devil's not even afraid of the preaching that's going on right now. But I'll tell you what makes him shake in his shoes is when we begin to pray and lift the name of Jesus up. You let some ladies gather here on Tuesday night for a prayer meeting and watch as heaven pours out the Spirit. That's when the devil is afraid is when there's a praying church. He shakes in his boots. When we begin to pray, praise the Lord. In closing this morning, a praying church is a dangerous church. And all of hell is afraid of a praying church. Never before in the history of this nation has there been a greater need for men and women to pray. If we the church do not find our knees in prayer, then we the church are going to lose everything we have. What makes the church is is not chicken dinners and padded pews and, and air conditioning. What makes the church is what we have felt here this morning, the power and the presence of God residing and flowing to heal and to restore and to deliver And the only way to have that is to pray. How many of you have God turned your life around? Everyone in this house. It should be our sole desire to pray. To pray and not stop until our lost son or daughter, until our lost loved one finds that same peace and salvation that God has bestowed upon us the greatest privilege and the greatest responsibility that has ever been given to the church is to pray. You want a title? You want to be ranked high in the kingdom of God? Title yourself a prayer warrior and you're at the top of the list. Not preacher, not musician, not Sunday school teacher. Title yourself prayer warrior and God elevates you up here to the top. Maybe unseen to the human eye. But I assure you today, a prayer warrior is at the top of the list. If we fail here, if the church fails at praying, we fail everywhere. It's in the most critical hour of our history. The church neglects the most important responsibility that we have, which is to pray. If we fail to pray, if you fail to have a prayer life. If I fail to have a prayer life, I'm going to get down on our level. We are handing our children and our grandchildren to the devil on a silver platter. Jesus said, my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer. That's why there's such an attack against church attendance. The devil has an agenda to destroy the nation and ultimately the world. For too long, the prayer of the church has been 
Lord, have mercy on us. Grace, 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 grace. Just help us make it through, oh Lord. I'm, I'm just trying to be saved here, and, and rightly so. I understand that. But I am convinced that the church now must assume a different posture of praying. And that is to pray and to be aggressive. Aggressive because we are at war, ladies and gentlemen. We may choose to stick our head in the sand and not realize what's going around, around us but we are at war and we are fighting for our souls and the souls of our loved ones and our family and every person outside of these walls that are lost. If you don't hear anything I say today, I want you to hear this. If we the church, and I'm talking about you and I, don't take an aggressive stand against the devil and all of hell, we're going to lose the battle. Jerry, I've read the back of the book. I, I know we win. Yeah, I've read the back of the book too. But we're going to lose the battle if we don't give ourselves to prayer. And the reason won't be because we got beat. The reason will be because we forfeited. We give up. In other words, it won't be because the devil is more powerful. It will simply be because we fail to access the power that's made available to us. We've got to pray as a church. We are in the last days, and I'm quickly trying to close. We are in the last days, and evil and persecution are coming. Matter of fact, it's not if it comes. It's here. It's here, ladies and gentlemen, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Would you stand across the house with me this morning? So now the church... More than ever, we must return to praying with power. I'm talking about when you don't feel like praying, praying. I'm talking about when you fall on your knees at this altar that you refuse to get up until God has moved on you or spoke to you or give you the confirmation that you were seeking. I'm talking about Praying with power. Praying with apostolic power until we see an explosion of apostolic power. I think it would be appropriate this morning to make an altar where you stand. Make an altar where you sit or find a place around this front. But just for a few moments this morning, could we fall on our face before God and pray, pray, Pray with power this morning.